God as a service. And just from the spontaneous gratitude of their heart, they were all coming. And he was saying goodbye to everyone. And they were crying and offering their obeisances and expressing their gratitude. And many people just said, we're coming with you to Navad. We, we cannot give up your association. So he said, all right. So some were coming and some were going. And while all this was happening, he was just about to leave. There's a story of one Brahmin. His name is Tapan Mishra. He was a great scholar. He yearned to understand what truly is the goal of life and how to achieve it. What is the satya and the sadhana? He read volumes and volumes of literatures, scriptures, philosophies. For years he was studying. And he was going to so many pundits, rishis, yogis, inquiring what is the goal of life and how to achieve it? And from all the books he read and from all the teachers he met, he got so many different opinions. And none of them satisfied him or convinced him. He was a devotee in the sense he worshipped God with all his heart. He was worshipping God practically day and night while he was going from teacher to teacher and reading book after book, he was worshiping God, praying, please show me the way. And one night, just before the sun was to rise, as before, he had a dream. In that dream, a divine personality appeared. and said, you will learn what is the goal of life and how to achieve it. And you will attain all perfections if you go to Nimai Pandit. He's on the banks of Padmavati River. He's just about to leave. Nimai Pandit. is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Nara Narayan. He is the ultimate goal of life and he can teach you the way to him. But he's appearing in this world just like an ordinary person. Go to him. But do not tell anyone about this dream. The person disappeared. Tapan Mishra immediately got up and he, he started crying. And then he went to the place where Nimai Pandit was just about to leave on the banks of the river. He was sitting there surrounded by his students who were all offering him their gratitude in so many ways. And the great Tapan Mishra, very honored scholar, he came before Nimai Pandit, who was just a teenager at the time, <laughs> and he offered his prostrated Dandavat pranams. And then with folded hands, he spoke. He said, I am the lowest, most fallen person. I'm so materially encaged. He said, I have been reading so many books and so many teachers. I want to know what is the goal of life and how can I achieve it? He said, Material happiness 
gives no peace or pleasure to my heart anymore. Please instruct me. And he started to cry. He was really inquiring with a sense of deep urgency and humility from his heart. Nimai smiled. And he told him that you are very fortunate because you are seeking the highest truth. To cross over this material existence is very, very difficult. To achieve devotion to Krishna is not easy. Only the most fortunate person can seek this blessing. He said, in the four yugas, there is a specific path by which we can attain the perfection. And Lord Chaitanya Nimai quoted different shastras. He quoted Bhagavad Gita. Paritra naya sadhunam vinashaya chuduskritam dharma samstapanarataya sambhavami yuge yuge. That the Supreme Lord tells that he comes again and again and again to reestablish true religious principles within this world. The Lord comes in a different color in each yuga to establish the yuga dharma. In Satya Yuga, he appeared in a white complexion and established meditation as the way to attain love for Krishna. In the Treta Yuga, he comes in a red complexion and taught by his example, yagya or sacrifice. In the Dwapar Yuga, he appears in a blackish complexion for the purpose of teaching worship of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. And in Kali Yuga, the Yuga Dharma, is the congregational chanting of the holy names of the Lord. He said, through meditation, through sacrifices, or through worship, one cannot achieve the ultimate perfection in Kali Yuga. It is only through the chanting of the holy names. Now you go home. That's what he told Chaparmisha, go home, back to your house and family, and worship Krishna by chanting his holy names. And avoid all duplicity. Very important. These are the simple instructions he gave. Go home, keep love of Krishna as the goal of your life, chant his holy name, and avoid duplicity. That means to have a simple heart, not to have ulterior motives. A simple heart is a heart where the, f where the seed of bhakti grows very, very nicely when we chant the holy name. If we don't have a... Simplicity means a grateful, humble heart. That's not trying to deceive. That really has the motivation to serve and to please. That is a simple heart. And among the associates of Lord Chaitanya or among the great saints of Srimad Bhagavatam or through history, whether one is living, herding cows, or whether one is the king of an empire, or whether one is a swami in a, in a, in a cave in the, in the mountains. Griheitako vanetako sadahari boletako. Whatever our situation, greatness is having a simple heart. To forgive is simplicity. Then Lord Chaitanya told him, 
the sadhya, the only true goal of life is ecstatic love for Krishna, devotional service. And the only way to achieve it in this age of Kali is through the chanting of Krishna's holy names. Lord Chaitanya cited the Brihad Naradiya Purana. Harinama, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasteva, 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 Gatiranyata. In this age of Kali, there is no alternative, no alternative, no alternative than the chanting of the names of Hari. Then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, for the first time in his Leela, he revealed something very special. He said, now I will teach you how to do this Harinam. Chant this mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare This 32-syllable, 16-word mantra, which is the very essence of all the hymns of the Vedas, the essence of all knowledge, the essence of all mantras. And by chanting this Maha Mantra, the dormant love for Krishna within your heart will sprout and grow. And that will be your perfection. Simply by living without duplicity, keeping your mind on the goal of love of Krishna and chanting this mantra, he said, you will understand everything about satya and sadhana. Tapan Mishra was so grateful. He said, I want to go to Navadweep with you. Lord Chaitanya was letting so many other people come to Navadweep with him. He told Tapan Mishra, you should go to live in Varanasi immediately. This was quite incredible because there was no devotees in Varanasi. <laughs> People were blaspheming devotion in Varanasi. And at the same time, Navadweep is where Lord Chaitanya was just about to establish his Harinam Sankirtan movement, and all the greatest devotees from everywhere were coming to Navadweep to live with him, to be with him. Now, at this time, there was no hint that Lord Chaitanya would ever take sannyas. He hadn't even called, gone to Gaya yet to meet Ishwara Puri. He hadn't yet even begun the Sankirtan movement. He hadn't yet be revealed to the world that he was a devotee yet. But Lord Chaitanya told Tapan Mishra, you go to Varanasi and I will come there and teach you everything. Tapan Mishra had faith. Then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embraced Tapan Mishra. And Tapan Mishra, his hairs were standing on end, tears were coming from his eyes, he was trembling, he was actually in ecstasy. And then he grabbed Lord Chaitanya's lotus feet and he told Lord Chaitanya about the dream. Lord Chaitanya smiled. He said that was a, he said whatever is said in that dream is true. But do not tell anyone, as long as I am on this earth, do not tell anyone about this dream. Then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left. Tapan Mishra went to Varanasi. They had a child. 
Their child's name was Raghunath. He became the great Raghunath Bhatta Goswami. Now I could, there's really an incredible story. I, I, actually, this is just the introduction to an incredible story. <laughs> But I'm going to end. But I'll just give you a little <laughs> hint of what's to come. Tapan Mishu and Tavaranasi. There was no association. There was only one person, Chandrasekhar. And the two of them were like, everyone else was very much opposed to the principles of bhakti. And meanwhile, he's hearing the news how Lord Chaitanya established Harinam Sankirtan movement and he's having kirtans at Srivas Thakur's house all night and he's planting mango seeds and the mangoes are growing and they have no seeds and they have no skins. <laughs> <laughs> and devotees, after doing kirtan all day with Lord Chaitanya dancing, they would have mango festivals together, and Lord Chaitanya would personally pick the mangoes and give it to each devotee. Can you imagine? He could have gone to Navadvi, but Lord Chaitanya wanted him in Varanasi, so he's, this was how dutiful he was. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakura would say, do not try to see Krishna. Try to serve Krishna in a way that Krishna is pleased to see you. And what does it mean to serve? Serve doesn't mean I do what I want. It means I do what Krishna wants. Lord Chaitanya wanted him in Varanasi. <laughs> so he was there. And meanwhile, Lord Chaitanya is dancing to the house of Chandkazi and doing so many incredible, wonderful things in Navadweep. The whole spiritual world, it was an inundation of ecstatic love. And Harinam and Navadweep. But then Lord Chaitanya took sannyas. And he left Navadweep. And he went to Puri. And from Puri, he traveled for two years through South India. And then he came back to Puri. So Tapan Mishra was patiently waiting, just chanting Hare Krishna, <laughs> meditating on the goal of life, with faith in Lord Chaitanya's words that he would come. He was waiting there for years and years and years. And then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, on his way to Vrindavan, he stopped in Varanasi. He stayed at the house of Chandrasekhar, and he would take prasad with Tapan Mishra's home. But he only stayed for a very short time, then he went to Vrindavan. At that time, Tapan Mishra and Chandrasekhar were revealing their hearts to Lord Chaitanya. That when, you know, you're having kirtan here, the sannyasis, the mayavadi sannyasis, they are blaspheming and saying the most terrible things against you. They're calling you an illiterate fool. They're saying you're just a sentimentalist who's associating with fanatics. They're saying ignorant fools, they may be attracted to the Sri Krishna Chaitanya, but we are sannyasis, we are knowers of Vedanta, we cannot take his sentimentality and his neophyteness seriously. They were saying so many things. And Tapan Mishra and Chandrasekhar, they were hearing this constantly. Their hearts were breaking. Lord Chaitanya just smiled. And then he went to Vrindavan. <laughs> and then on his way back, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how merciful. 
no more Mahavara Nyaya. Here's these very highly elevated sannyasis who are all from very elevated Brahmin families. And they're ridiculing and accusing Lord Chaitanya of so many terrible things. And what does Lord Chaitanya do? He stays at the house of Chandrasekhar, who was by caste designations a sutra. It's completely against the sannyas principles, according to the Shankar school, to stay at the house of a sutra. He could have stayed at Tapanmisha's house. He was a Brahmin, but he stayed at a sutra's house, Kayasta, because Lord Chaitanya just didn't care. <laughs> because he saw Chandrasekhar as a great saint because he was a devotee of Krishna and he was taking shelter of the holy names. <laughs> It was during that time that Sanatana Goswami appeared in Varanasi. And this is where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu fulfilled his word to Tapan Mishra. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed Sanatana Goswami practically from sunrise to sunset every day for two months in all the details of the philosophy and the lifestyle of what is the goal of life and how to achieve it. Tapan Mishra was there. Lord Chaitanya instructed him in every way. And he had a little son and that son, during the two months when Lord Chaitanya was in Varanasi, instructing Sanatan Goswami, Tapan Mishra, hearing everything, at that time, little Raghunath used to massage Lord Chaitanya's feet and do services for him. And Lord Chaitanya blessed him. One day, Tapan Mishra and Chandrasekhar told Lord Chaitanya that the kinds of blasphemy we're constantly hearing against you is too painful. We want to give up our lives. We can't hear it anymore. And you know what Lord Chaitanya did? He slightly smiled <laughs> and didn't say anything. And at that moment, a Brahmin came and bowed down to Lord Chaitanya and said, please fulfill my desire. He said, I've invited all the great sannyasis of Varanasi to my house for prasad, and I know you never associate with them, but it is my desire that you come to my house for prasad that day. And Lord Chaitanya said, I will come. And he came. When he entered, he saw there the leader of all the sannyasis, Prakashananda Saraswati, among so many other really powerful scholarly ascetics with their dundas. They were sitting on a raised platform. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu very humbly, he went to the place where everybody washes their feet, because that was the custom. He washed his feet, and then right by the foot wash, he sat down. When he sat down, the light of the Brahma Jyoti spread from his body. He was illuminated, and these impersonalistic sannyasis, their goal of life is Brahman. <laughs> so their hearts really got soft when they saw this, the Brahma Jyoti coming out of Lord Chaitanya's body. 
was like the sun, and he looked so beautiful. And yet he was so humble. He was sitting in that lower place where everyone had just washed their feet. Prakashananda Saraswati, he said, why are you sitting in such a dirty place? Are you feeling some, some moroseness? Is there a problem? Why don't you sit with us? Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, with such respect and sweetness, his voice was so sweet, he said that I am from a lower order of sannyas. I am not qualified to sit with all of you. His humility melted the hearts of all the sannyasis. Prakashananda Saraswati stood up and came down to where Lord Chaitanya was and took him by the hand and said, please come and sit with us. And they sat together. And then they challenged Lord Chaitanya. They said, you are beautiful like Lord Narayan, and we're very happy that you are here, but why you never come to be with us? The duty of a sannyasi is to study Vedanta. You are from, Kesh you are from um, Keshava Bharati, the Bharati Sampradaya, that is our line. Why are you mixing with ordinary fanatics just singing and dancing in the streets? This is not becoming of a sannyasi. You should be with us studying Vedanta. Why? Lord Chaitanya spoke very sweetly. He said, the reason is this. My guru called me a fool and chastised me. He told me that you are a fool. You are not qualified to study Vedanta. You should just chant the names of Krishna. That is the essence of all the Vedic hymns. And he taught me to chant the names of Krishna. He told them, me, if I simply chant Hare Krishna, I will get freedom from all material sufferings and I will, I will see Krishna. And then he gave me a verse. Harunama, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalo Nasteva, 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 Gatiratyanha. Then in this age of Kali, there is no other way except chanting of the name of Krishna to, to, un, to actually understand the real goal of life. So I took the words of my guru very seriously. And I started to chant Hare Krishna. I was always chanting Hare Krishna. And then something happened. I started crying and my limbs started trembling. I started dancing. I became a madman. I was thinking, what's happening to me? So I went back to my guru and I asked him, what kind of mantra have you given me? It seems to be covering all my knowledge. I'm just dancing and I'm chanting and I'm crying. <clears throat> My guru told me that is the nature of the chanting of Krishna's holy names. One develops love for Krishna. Artha, Dhamma, Kama, Moksha. Economic development, religiosity, um, <clears throat> sense gratification, and liberation are the goals that practically everyone is trying to achieve through their religious practices. But all these goals, including liberation itself, are insignificant like a tiny drop in comparison to the 
to the limitless ocean of bhakti, prema, pure devotional service and love for Krishna. So I'm very happy with you, my child. This is very good. You have attained the supreme goal of life by chanting Krishna's holy names. I am pleased with you, and I'm obliged with you. So you should continue this chanting in the association of devotees and preach the glories of Harinam and deliver the people in general. Lord Chaitanya told that I firmly believe in what my guru has told me. And therefore, when I'm with these people chanting and dancing, I'm not doing anything it, it, deliberately. It's automatic. It's natural. It's, it's my love. The Mayavadis heard this. They were very impressed, actually. They said, this is very good. <laughs> we're, we're, it's very good that you love God and that you're a devotee of Krishna. We have no objection to that. But still, why do you avoid us? You never talk to us. You never come to see us. And you don't come to study Vedanta with you, with me, with us. And Lord Chaitanya, very humble. He asked permission. He said, if you don't mind, I will say something about Vedanta. <laughs> they were so charmed by his humility and his graciousness and his respectfulness. They said, you are so, you're like Lord Narayan to us. <laughs> they said, you're so, you're so gracious. We have faith that whatever you speak will be reasonable. And then Lord Chaitanya spoke. He said that Vedanta is the word of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And his own literary incarnation, Vyasadeva, has compiled. Because Vyasadeva is the absolute truth, he's the Lord. Whatever he writes is perfect. Any mortal person, we have four of defects. We have imperfect senses, tendency to cheat. We make mistakes and we are invariably illusioned. But the absolute truth is beyond all these imperfections. So whatever is spoken is perfect and pure. <clears throat> so the Upanishads, the Vedic literatures, when they speak about Brahman, Parabrahman, they are to be understood directly. But in your system of philosophy, you are taking Vedanta, and for every sutra, you are giving indirect explanations. And therefore, you are covering the true essence of what Vedanta is speaking. The Vedanta and all the great Vedic literatures are ultimately speaking about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who possesses all opulences, whose form, his personality, whose pastimes, whose names are eternal and spiritual. But you are saying, in your philosophy, Shankaracharya has written that the Lord's person, the Lord's form, his pastimes and his abode are transformations of sattva guna, the mode of goodness. Therefore, ultimately, they're temporary and they're maya. 
Nowhere in Vedanta, nowhere in the Vedic literatures does it say that. This is an indirect speculative interpretation. The Lord's form is such an ananda, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. And to serve him and to love him is the ultimate perfection of life. The jiva is the Lord's energy. The Lord has inconceivable various energies. And those energies, by the power of the Lord, He transforms those energies. But because you deny the nature of the energies of the Lord, you consider if the energies are transformed, that means the absolute truth sense is transformed. And since the absolute truth cannot be transformed, therefore, the, ultimately, the Lord has no energies. Bhagavad Gita, Apareyami Tashvanyam. He explains that be, beyond these external, the material, external energies of earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego, there is my spiritual energy, jiva-bhuta mahabha, which is the living entities, the jivas. Krishna declares the jiva to be his energies. Bhagavan is the energetic, and all living beings are the energies. Bhagavan is like the fire, and the living entities, the jivas, are like the sparks. The absolute truth, Bhagavan, is perfect, complete. But his energies can be transformed. And then he described there's the spiritual energy, there's the marginal jiva energy, and there's the material energy. These are always existing. And therefore the jiva has, through its independent will, the vulnerability to come under the control of illusion. But Krishna can never come under control of illusion. And therefore the jiva can never become Krishna. The jiva is eternally the servant of Krishna. Use the example of a touchstone. How a touchstone can Touch an object and transform it from iron to gold. But the touchstone itself is never transformed. So similarly, Krishna, who's the cause of all causes, through his energies, by his will, there's many transformations. But he always remains Ishwara, the absolute truth. Satchirananda. Sri Chaitanya explained this, and then he explained how in the Vedic literatures, the Mahavakya is Omkara, which is the sound representative, representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So you are teaching that Tatvam Asi is the um, Mahavakya which means you are of the same spiritual identity. I am that. He said that is just a detail in the Vedas. And he explained the essence of the science of what Omkar truly is. It's the representative of the absolute truth. The Vaishnava perspective, three letters, Aum. A is Krishna. Ahu, you is Radharani, and M is the Jiva. And Om, the whole existence, the Jiva is the energies of the Lord. Everything is contained within this one syllable. All the Vedas are born of this one syllable. And you are trying to avoid that. 
Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained every sutra in such a special way with a direct meaning. Srila Prabhupada made it really simple. Recently, I was in a place where I was speaking on a platform with a Shankaracharya. And it's incredible because he was constantly quoting Gita and he was constantly quoting Sarva Dharman Parityaja Mami Kam Sharanambraja. And Lord Chaitanya is talking about how in the Mayavadi concept, there's indirect interpretations. But to understand Vedanta properly, we have to understand it directly as it is. So Krishna is saying, Sarva Dharman Parityaja Mami Kam Sharanambraja. And it's being quoted again and again and again and again. Krishna saying, surrender to me. Aham Sarvasya Prabhavo, everything's coming from me. So the direct interpretation is when Krishna says me, he means Krishna. <laughs> when Krishna says Aham Sarvasya, I am, I means Krishna. That's very direct. Just like if Gopinath Chandra Prabhu, he's sitting there, he says, if he says, please give me some water. So direct inter interpretation is I should give Gopinath Chandra some water. But word jugglery is, well, Krish well, what he really means is the unborn, unmanifest, impersonal existence <laughs> within him. And since that one unborn, unmanifest, impersonal within him is everywhere, <laughs> so therefore I'll give some water to um, Sri Dhamma. <laughs> Or I'll drink it myself, that's even better. Since I'm non-different than him, I'll just drink it myself. <laughs> so, very simple. Prabhupada, when he was reading Bhagavad Gita from one scholar at 26 Second Avenue, Krishna says, man mana bhava mad bhakta. And Krishna's big, Worship me, become my devotee. Offer your homage unto me. This way you will come to me without fear. And this commentary was saying, when Krishna says me, he means the unborn, invisible, impersonal, all-pervading existence within himself. But why nowhere in Bhagavad Gita does Krishna say that? Nowhere in any scripture. When Krishna says me, when Ram says me, why don't they even once say, I'm talking about the impersonal, all-pervading, in inconceivable nature within me, which, is, which means you. <laughs> Nowhere. Me means me. <laughs> so Lord Chaitanya is explaining this. It's so simple. Just understand it directly. When it talks about God's form and it talks about God's personality and it talks about his eternality, why do you have to talk about all these to try to cloud the, the simple understanding? Krishna tells in Gita, Janma karma cha me divyam evam yoviti tattva tattyaktva deyam punara janma naiti mameti sojan. It's very direct. Divya means divine. It means beyond birth, beyond death, beyond maya. My appearance, my activities are transcendental. They're not a transformation of the mode of goodness in maya that's just temporarily manifesting. If we understand how Krishna's activities, his forms, his names are divine. Omkar is not just the Maha Mantra. These are not just temporary words. They are divine sound vibrations. And by understanding them, we never take birth again. Krishna says, you attain my abode. My abode. We can interpret that in so many ways. 
after Lord Chaitanya explained this, the sannyasis, they were quite um, deeply moved. They said, can you tell us what is the direct understanding of Vedanta Sutra? And I don't have time to say too much more. But Lord Chaitanya basically explained that the Vedas, and he proved us on the basis of the Vedic literatures, the Vedas are primarily speaking three principles, Sambandha, Abhideya, and Prayojana. Sambandha is how to actually establish our relationship with the Supreme. The Lord is Brahman. There's the all-pervading impersonal Brahman, and there's also Parabrahman. You see, the bhakti tradition is so inclusive. Vadanti tattva vidas tattvam yajganam advayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti samjite. The impersonal, all-pervading Brahman is Krishna. Bhagavan is, also, is the ultimate source of Brahman, Krishna, Parabrahman, and the Paramatma, they are all eternally existing simultaneously. So a devotee doesn't say that the impersonal Brahman is Maya. You understand? That's a realization of Krishna. And Brahmavad philosophy is to understand Krishna as the all-pervading Brahman. But the problem with Mayavad, they consider Bhagavan to be Maya, illusion. The form of God, the personality of God, the Leela of God, the abode of God is all just a transformation of material energy, and temporary, and ultimately Maya. One time somebody was saying, why do devotees say so harsh things against impersonalists? I said, we accept impersonal Brahman, which is the goal of impersonalists. We accept it's Krishna. But when impersonalists say that Krishna's body and Krishna's form and Krishna's pastimes are Maya, that's an insult to Krishna. We don't preach against Brahman, but they preach against Krishna, so we must defend. We can't just let people say that. So it's actually, they're, they're the ones who are attacking. We're just defending the truth. My constitutional eternal nature is a servant of Krishna. And Abhideya is our sadhana. Abhideya is the actual activities of devotional service that awaken our eternal nature. And prayojana is that goal, the satya, ecstatic love for Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained to them, and by practicing the nine processes of devotional service, especially chanting Krishna's names in this, in this age of Kali, that is the primary sadhana for realizing the prayojana, or love for Krishna. And all the sannyasis, hearing Lord Chaitanya's explanation, they say, everything you said is true. And they all started to chant Krishna's holy name. They were all transformed, Lord Chaitanya. And they begged Lord Chaitanya forgiveness for all the terrible things they were saying against him. And he forgave them and smiled and gave them ecstatic love for Krishna. They were very happy. And sometime later, when Sanatan Goswami came through Varanasi, he saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people with their arms raised, ecstatically crying, chanting Krishna's holy name. Krishna, 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 Krishna. <laughs> 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 
Tapan Mishra and Chandrasekhar were very happy. <laughs> Their goals were very much to see all these people become devotees of the Lord and develop the highest appreciation and love for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And now the whole place was vibrating with Harinam and love for Krishna. They were so happy. And he would send his son Raghunath to come to Puri to serve Lord Chaitanya. He would stay there for some months. And Raghunath Bhatta Goswami was expert at cooking. He would cook for, for prasad. And he was expert at singing the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam in various different ragas. Lord Chaitanya would be so pleased to hear him sing the Srimad Bhagavatam with such devotion and such artistic um, beauty. And after being in Puri for some time, Lord Chaitanya told Raghunath Bhatta, you should go back to your mother and father because they're great Vaishnavas, Tap and Mishra, and you should stay with them and serve them as long as they're living. So he went back to Varanasi and served his parents. And his parents, when it was time for them to go back to Godhead, they blessed Raghunath Bhatta. Now you go back to Lord Chaitanya. And they chanted Krishna's names and went back home, back to Godhead. Then Raghunath Bhatta went to be with Lord Chaitanya and personally served him again in Puri. And after some months, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him, go to Vrindavan. Bring these gifts to offer to Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, and live with them. Be friends with them for the rest of your life. And Raghunath Bhatta Goswami went back to Vrindavan. And there he would cook for the six Goswami. He would cook for the Goswamis of Vrindavan. He became a priest assisting Rupa Goswami at Radha Govinda Temple. He became such a powerful devotee, such a preacher. The general for the, for the emperor of India became his disciple. Rajman Singh. He wanted to do some seva. So Raghunath Bhatta Goswami saw that Rupa Goswami's Govinda Dev was just living in a little place. He said, build a beautiful temple. Under the direction of Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, the Govindaji temple was built. The greatest temple in the whole of North India. And Raghunath Bhatta Goswami gave Govindaji a special flute an earring shaped like sharks. And he worshipped. He was the servant of the servant of the Goswamis. Goswami himself, great scholar, great Vaishnav, great preacher, powerful disciples. But yet he loved to cook for the, his brothers and discuss Srimad Bhagavatam with them. And especially Krishna Kirtana Garna Nartana. The Goswamis would love to chant the holy names and dance together. The goal of life is to love Krishna. The way of attaining that goal is chanting Krishna's names without duplicity, with a simple heart, in the mood of a servant of the servant of the servant. When we please Krishna through this process and we study these wonderful literatures that Srila Prabhupada has given us, we could actually understand, realize,
This is the gift of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Thank you very much.